Good morning. Good to be with you today, and uh, especially want to welcome those that are watching online with us as well. Um, that's just a reminder about this month is our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and uh, I hope you've already given to that, or you plan to give, or uh, also challenge yourself to maybe even give more this year, and uh, appreciate our missionaries and what they do. Uh, I know uh, Glenn up there might have got excited because it was Dr. Pepper. He loves Dr. Pepper, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's an easy way to remember that missionary from Tanzania. Pull out a Dr. Pepper can, think about Lottie Moon and missions there, and I appreciate your giving to that each and every year as well. We're going to continue our Christmas series uh, today with our second, uh, second lesson on that, or second study on that, and to kind of help me get started uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to ask one of our kids to come up and help me. So Jackson Ellisor, Jackson, you want to come up and help that a little bit? All right. All right, come on up here, Jackson. You can stand right here. I saw that. All right, so Jackson, uh, tell me uh, what this thing is here. Do you know what that is? The nativity. The nativity, okay. A nativity scene or nativity set. And where all have you seen some of those at? At my house. At your house? A bunch of churches. A bunch of churches. There used to be one in my school. There used to be one in your school, Okay. Good. Yeah, sometimes we see them out in different places in the community and whatnot. So now, where's the one at your in your house at? We usually put it, um, like, up on the shelf. Up on the shelf. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Um, I want to let you see if you can tell me a little bit. Tell me about who, who are these, these three guys. They kind of look similar. Who are they? The wise men. The wise men. Okay. Do you, you, can you tell me anything about them? You know anything about they brought them? Their gifts to Jesus. They brought their gifts to Jesus, they right? Saw a big star and they followed it. And they saw a star and followed it. Very good. You're doing great with that. Okay. What about these guys over here? Who are they? Um, Got some sheep around their shoulders. Shepherds. shepherds. Very good. Yeah, shepherds. All right. So they're shepherds, and then. Um, what do, you, do you know anything about, remember anything about the shepherds? Like where were they when they uh, the, heard about it? The, they were in the fields and the angel came down and said, don't be afraid. Very good. Yeah, they were in the fields and when the angel came out, he told them not to be afraid and told them where to go to find the baby, right? All right, and, and who, who is this here? Mary. Mary, okay, that's Jesus' mother and this is... Jesus, and of course we have little sheep there as well. All right, well, one other question, well, two other questions for you. One question is, um, have, you ever, have you ever been in a Christmas play? And did you get to play one of these people? Um, I might have, I don't really remember. You can't remember, yeah. Parents do that, they stick you in stuff when you're little, and <laughs> you don't remember. I remember uh, I've got a picture of Nathan uh, when he was uh, like... I think four or five, and he was an angel. And, um, I think we might have done one yeah. here. Okay, might have done one here. Might have been a wise man or something. So. Or attendant to a wise man. Cool. All right, well, I want you to look up there. There is actually a piece of the figurines missing. Can you tell me? Who? Joseph. Joseph, that's right. Very good. All right, y'all give Jackson a hand. He did well with the nativity set, didn't he? All right. Jackson, you did great with that. Um, Joseph is missing. But we're going to put him back in today because that's who we are going to be talking about in our second sermon on this series. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we'll be looking at that uh, today. And um, as you're turning there, uh, I want to just go ahead and tell you up front uh, my notes are on the screen. Uh, you have Pastor Ralph's notes in your worship guide. So uh, you'll, they, won't, they won't match. So you'll need to, if you want to take notes, find some other place on your worship guide or, or paper, extra paper, if you want to write notes and take notes on that. So I just want to give you that word up front. Uh, so you'll know that. And it'll make it a little easier for you. Um, before we get into the text, a couple little 
few little tidbits about nativity scenes. The first one was done in Italy in about 800 years ago. And I'll tell you more about that toward the end of the message today. Um, from that, it expanded to churches like uh, Jackson had mentioned. Um, also, there is a placement order. This was something I, I didn't know. You know. I figured just put them wherever you wanted to put them. But um, Mary is always to uh, the left of, or rather to the right of Jesus, our left looking at her. And the shepherds and the sheep are always to this side of her. Uh, and so Joseph is always on the, um, on the right side uh, of baby Jesus when we look at him or on his left. And the wise men and their camels, if, if there were camels, uh, would be there on that side. So there's a certain order of placement, and there's reasons for that. Um, another little interesting fun fact is some countries will add native animals to their, uh, to their nativity set, sets or their live sets. And uh, one of those is Australia. If you go see a nativity or live nativity scene in Australia, you may see some kangaroos bouncing around there. So kind of different, huh? Uh, but uh, that's what happens if you go around and you see those, those things, nativity sets. And of course, I mentioned the question was, which piece is missing? And it is the missing piece of Joseph. When we think about Joseph, as I, more I studied him and looked at him this week, I think of a man who was basically silent. He's silent. He plays it like a silent actor in, in God's movie and his play here about Jesus. And when you think about children's plays, that's pretty much what you get. Now think about, I asked Jackson if he had ever played a part in, in a Christmas play. And uh, if I asked some of you older adults, especially if you did, you would say, yeah, I did that. Think who you played. You probably didn't jump for the position of being Joseph, unless maybe you liked the cute girl who was playing Mary, and then you might have tried for that. But most of the time, you know, guys, they like the shepherds. They like the wise men. I mean, what's cooler than wearing a crown on your head and having a robe and being, being wealthy for just a little bit? And what's better than being a shepherd and having that staff so you can prod the other kids when the music teacher's not looking, right? Uh, that's what, usually what we go after in trying to be those parts. Or maybe an angel. Those are always pretty neat as well. But Joseph, he didn't get a high ranking as far as the parts somebody would want. And it's interesting when you look at Scripture, Joseph never speaks. Never speaks. He never speaks. Look at all the other Christmas characters. Mary, she gets to converse with an angel one-on-one. -on -one. Also gets to sing that great a poem that, that's in there about her praise to God for looking upon her and favoring her. Um, even the shepherds, even the shepherds get to say in the Bible, uh, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has done that the angel has told us about. Um, the wise men, they even get to come in in Matthew and say a few lines. Where is he born, the king of the Jews? And even the scribes, they get to tell them where he was at, at Bethlehem. And poor old Joseph, even the cattle's get, cattle gets to speak according to the carol away in a manger. Uh, verse 2, stanza 2 says, the cattle are lowing. If you know anything about that, that means they're mooing. And they're making sounds. But Joseph, no words for him. So you, we might ask, could Mary have done this alone? Well, our verses in tonight, today's scripture tell us that was a possibility. If Joseph had gone a different way with his decision and his direction, if he had continued with his humanly thought about what he should do, but that changed. And Joseph is pretty important. Uh, when you look at him, I like to call him the workhorse of the characters in this Christmas story. Uh, he certainly does a lot of things. And if I had to rank them, I would, of course, say God is, is number one. I mean, he's the one that put this all together that inspired the prophets in the Old Testament to write about Jesus that would be coming as a Messiah. All the way to arranging it where a secular ruler like the emperor of Rome, Augustus, made a census that would take and require Joseph to go to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born there, even though he grew up in Nazareth. God did all that. You have to give him credit. He's the number one person in all that. Number two, I would almost say Joseph, but I'm not going to do that, ladies. <laughs> I 
because I'm going to see Mary. Uh, mainly because I remember my own wife going through three pregnancies, 27 months carrying kids. Two of the kids, the last two, she was pretty much sick every day. So I'm not going to say no, <laughs> that Mary was not, certainly uh, had a job there greater than Joseph. But Joseph would be a close number three in the nativity s s story. He lends physical, emotional, and spiritual support to Mary and to Jesus, as we'll see. Joseph's role can be summed up by one word, and that word is devotion. Devotion is defined as loyalty, as love, as enthusiasm, and care for a person, an activity, or a cause. Now, if you're like me, you can look around this world, especially here in Alabama, and you can see some people are devoted to some things, can't you? Yep. Last night was a good example of devotion. <laughs> there were people rooting both those teams down to the last couple of seconds. And we know people who are devoted to sports team. They have a whole room, maybe a, a shrine, if, if you will, in their, in their homes with everything of that team they can put in there. And others that show up at ball games and they, they've stripped down halfway and they got, they're painted and that's devotion. You know, there's other people that are devoted to, since we just had Thanksgiving, they're devoted to Black Friday. Not quite as bad as it used to be, but I remember people would, they would line up at stores and camp out and they were ready to do whatever it took to get that by. They were devotees to that day, that special holiday. There are people who are devoted to entertainers as well. Think about Taylor Swift. Man, all the fans that she has and they've even got a label that's called, been called Swifties to follow her. Wow. Man, you can be devoted to almost anything. There's people devoted to their state. I have a brother-in-law that every time I go to Texas and every time I leave, he goes, well, glad you came to the best state. He'll say, everything's bigger and better in Texas. And I said, yeah, I know I lived there and I left it and came back <laughs> to Alabama. So that's so true. And then people will, you know, they're devoted to all kinds of things, even monuments like the boll weevil. Hmm, wonder who that was. Um, and then... Even, even animals and causes. One lady I was reading about in California, she was devoted to rescuing cats. And she did so much that she rescued thousands over her lifetime. How devoted was she? Well, number one, she uh, sold her Mercedes and her Cadillac and used her retirement fund to take care of them throughout the years. And not only that, she moved out of her own 4,005 square, square foot house and let the cats have that and moved into a trailer. Now that's devotion, folks, <laughs> when you're devoted to an animal that much. Joseph's devotion was an example for us. It is Joseph's actions that speak louder than his absence of words. And for most men, that, that's pretty much true. You know, we're known for our actions. We're known for what we do and fixing things and being there and, and not necessarily for many words. We've often even said that. He's a man of few words. But yet, they're faithful. They're here. So let's pick up the story in Matthew 1, verse 18. And Matthew 1, 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed. After his mother Mary was betrothed, to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now verse 18 picks up where we left off last week with Luke, where Mary gets the information and she accepts her role and then she begins to carry the Christ child as the Holy Spirit has overshadowed her and, and brought that about. She went, if you remember Luke's uh, gospel account, she immediately felt the need to go see her older cousin, Elizabeth. And there, Elizabeth too was pregnant. And so I'm sure they shared a lot of things together. And about after three months, the Bible tells us that it was time for Elizabeth to be prepared to uh, deliver. So Mary goes home. So she's about three months pregnant when she's coming back into, into uh, Nazareth. And we don't know, you know, what the talk or how much they talked in that time period. 
Uh, betrothal was a little different than our day. In our day, uh, people get engaged. You meet a girl, you meet a guy, you begin to fall in love, you feel that commitment that maybe they're the one. So the guy pops a question, gives the ring, and you're engaged. And then that goes up until the point of your marriage date and then your wedding. Up until that time, it can be called off all the way to the end. That's why I tell couples all the time. I said, you just come let me know if you want to change this. <laughs> and uh, none of them do. But uh, that, that's kind of how we see marriage in American culture. Um, if they call it off before that time, no, no sweat except maybe returning gifts and things like that. Um, but there's not a lot of legal stuff. In Joseph's day with Jewish betrothal, it was very different. There were two parts. Uh, first part was the families usually got together and arranged the marriage. So maybe Joseph's parents knew Mary's parents. Maybe they were in the same village and they did some things occasionally together. And all of a sudden they struck up that conversation. Hey, I think it would be good if my boy got with your daughter. And they began to talk that through. And there would be a, um, uh, a negotiation on a diary or dowry for the girl. Uh, so much money that would be gifted to her parents by the parents and the, and the groom of the other family. And once that happened, they were betrothed. Now, being betrothed was like being engaged. They, they kind of lived at their own places still. They talked to each other, but legally, they were married. If Mary, if Joseph, something happened to Joseph and he had died during the betrothal period, Mary would have been considered a widow. And she would have full legal rights to all that. And then there was a day, usually about a year after that first part, that first period of, of the dowry giving and the, the start of the betrothment, usually about a year, then they would have a ceremony where they got married. Where the groom would come and get his bride from her house and take her to his house. And along the way, there were celebrations and there were parties. And then it ended that night when the two were together to consummate their marriage. So it was a, it was a long process. So technically, in the Jewish eyes, these two were already married. And so all of a sudden, you have a dilemma for Joseph. We see that in the very next verse that Joseph has to decide what he wants to do. Now, we don't know how Joseph got the news. I wish we did. That'd be real interesting. Did it come from Mary herself? We're not sure. Did it come from Mary's parents, who obviously began to see Mary being pregnant? And maybe she told them, and they went to Joseph's parents and said, hey, look, um, Mary's pregnant, and we understand if you guys need to call this off or do something differently or whatever. Could have been that way. Could have been from Joseph's parents. They might have heard it through the grapevine and told it. Could have been even from some mean girls of the village <laughs> that simply saw Mary with her baby bump and began to talk and to criticize and gossip and make accusations. I'm just so glad that they didn't have Facebook in that day. <laughs> Poor Mary wouldn't have had a chance with the people around and all the news they could spread on that. So there it comes to, to Joseph. And he doesn't know about the Holy Spirit and, and, and uh, overshadowing Mary and all this. So I, I kind of tend to think that maybe if Mary did tell him something, she didn't tell him the whole thing. Or if, if not, it might have come through some other means. But in verse 19, it says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So first we see that Joseph, he was devoted to God's law. He was devoted to God's law. He, he was a man who was just, the Bible says. And now when it says just or righteous, it doesn't mean sinless. Only Jesus was sinless. Zacharias is called just and, and righteous. Elizabeth, his wife, means they were good and they tried to follow uh, the law of the, of the Lord from the Old Testament as best they could. They still sinned, they still had flaws, but as best they could, they tried to be that follower of God's law. And Joseph was like that. It says he was a just man. And so he began to consider what to do. And 
The Bible has a lot of, of, of commandments and things in it, but one of the ones that really stands out is adultery. And that's what this would have been if Mary had been with another man. And you can go back and read Deuteronomy 22 and 24, and it basically says if someone is caught in adultery like that, that other spouse can divorce them. And they also not only divorce them, but they can take them to the city gate and have them stoned to death. It's pretty serious back in that day. And so Joseph is contemplating what will he do? And he knows the law is there and he wonders, you know, how did this happen? Did Mary just cheat on me? Did she cheat on me while she was away? Did someone force themselves upon her? Why would Mary do this? So there had to be a lot of tension between these two. And, and they're talking one to another. And so Joseph stands off and he kind of makes, as I said, what would be a, a humanly decision about this. But not only was he devoted to God's law, he was also devoted to God's mercy. You know, God has his law, but he also has his mercy. And so Joseph looked in, to see if there was a way he could do this in a, in a simple way. In the Talmud, which was the commentary to the Old Testament, to some of the, to the law and everything in it, it said that you could divorce them privately. A certain way you had to do it, you could give them a certificate of divorce and you didn't have to go through the stoning or the, the publicness of it. And so that's what it says here, that he did not, he, want, he did want to, um, to, to break that off, but to not make a public example out of Mary and to put her away privately, the Bible says. Public example is an interesting word. It's a word that's used over in Colossians where Jesus had said after he uh, died on the cross and rose again that he went and preached to, uh, to those in prison, the spirits, and he, he, he triumphed over the devil and the, and the demons and the evil that had been brought through sin and made a public display of it, Paul says. Here, just the opposite, uh, Joseph does not want to make a public display. He does not want to shame Mary. He doesn't want her to be in any more uh, any more, looked down upon any more than she already is. He was devoted to God's law and to God's mercy. He was also, though, devoted to the revelation of God. Look in verses 20 through 23. It says, but while he thought about these things, and he must have mulled that over. Some of you have had tough decisions where, you know, they, you didn't make them in a day. There were several days, maybe weeks, maybe months, and he mulls it over and it says that while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So he's sleeping and he has this dream and saying to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. First of all, a caution. People sometimes might say they have a revelation from the Lord. Be cautious about that. It always needs to square up with God's word. You might remember Paul told the Galatians, uh, even if another, another angel comes to you and, and shares with you the, another gospel, he said, if it's not about Christ, it's not about the salvation, how it comes through him and his shed blood, don't listen to it. So even though he was a just man following God's law and mercy, he, he needed to be cautious even about this revelation from God. It came through the method of a dream. Now, Mary has Gabriel come directly to her. Uh, Zacharias had a vision of an angel there in the temple about John the Baptist's death. But the vehicle of, of, of speaking to Joseph from God seems to be a dream. Uh, pretty, pretty common, though, uh, when you look through the Old Testament character, especially his, his namesake back in, in Genesis, Joseph. He always was having dreams and interpreting dreams and, and guiding people uh, with that advice that came from the dream. Daniel was another one who could interpret dreams as well. And so here, 
a dream is given to him. And it will be the method continually. Whenever he needs to be warned to flee Herod and go to Egypt, it will be through a dream. Whenever he's told to come back to Nazareth, it will be through a dream with an angel as well. And also there's the address that makes this special. It says, Joseph, son of David. Now, he wasn't the son of David directly. His father had another name. Yet, he was called son of David. Why? Because he was in the line and the lineage of David. That sets us up for Luke 2. Whenever they have to go for the census in Bethlehem because he was of the lineage of David. This put him in the royal line. And both from Joseph and also, and also from Mary. More so from Mary. And so... He is told where he fits in this story. And he's making the connections, I think, as the angel reveals this to him. And then also the instructions. He tells them, this is what you're to do. You're to name him Jesus. And then the added prophecies there by Matthew from, from the Old Testament. That the virgin will be with child and will, be, will bear a son and will call his name Emmanuel. That's put together with that as well. So all those things begin to come together and Joseph begins to put the pieces together and he believes the revelation that's come from God now. Also, you might notice that it also says that um, she has been, she conceived in, in her is of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if Mary had told Joseph and he just didn't believe it, now he has the same individual story, the Holy Spirit. Found with child with the Holy Spirit. Others may not believe it, but now Joseph had the opportunity because he's heard it himself to believe it. He was devoted to the revelation from God. Third, he was also though devoted husband and foster father. As a husband, he met the physical and emotional and spiritual needs of Mary. Think about some of her needs. Certainly the physical needs, right? Especially thinking about that trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And that scene we always think of of Mary being on the donkey and Joseph leading it all that way through dangerous territory all the way to Bethlehem. Think about them when they get there and that Joseph has to take care of all the registration and that process of, of, uh, of adhering with the census. And then when Mary tells him, I think it's time to deliver, think of that Joseph going from end to end knocking on the doors and asking people, trying to explain, my wife is about to deliver and I have to find her a place. He certainly had the physical load and then being there even to help her possibly deliver as well in the manger. He didn't find much, only the stable, but what he found he made the best of. Good husbands do that. He also met the emotional need of her. Think about that as well. From the get-go, people talked. You got to believe that. People gossiped and they, they threw things at, at Mary with their words perhaps and about this young couple as well. And we don't know how, how he handled that. He might have just steadfastly stood by her without a word. He might have told the story that he had been told. But for good or bad, whether believed by others or not, he was by Mary. It's Mary, other people may forsake you. We don't, we don't even have a record of what their parents thought about this or not about the situation. But Joseph, emotionally, was going to stand by Mary. He was devoted to do that. He wasn't going to leave just because things got tough. And then also, not only as a husband, but as a foster father as well. He met Jesus' need for protection. After they had him, as I said, King Herod began to uh, fear and worry because the wise men came looking for a, a king. We've, we've heard there's going to be a king. We want to find him and worship him. And immediately Herod began to get jealous. And his plan was to send soldiers to wherever the wise men said they found him and have every baby there killed until they make sure that Jesus was killed. No rivals for this king. We know the story again. The angel warned Joseph, and Joseph, before that happened, took his family and fled to Egypt. And again, provided for them through his job as a carpenter or whatever else he did there to take care of them. And, and then listened to God for the time to come back to Nazareth to set up 
his family finally back there. He protected Jesus. He also taught Jesus. I believe he taught him a lot about carpentry. Jesus was known as the carpenter and the son of the carpenter. And in those days, you would learn as a Jewish boy, not only if you were going in some professional way, you also learned a, a trade so that you could work with your hands. Paul is an example of that when he's talking to the people he writes to in his letters. He'll tell them about how he was a tent maker and how he did that so that he wouldn't have to be a burden to them. They wouldn't have to pay for his lodging and pay for his food and, and everything. They could give him an offering if they wanted, but he wasn't going to drain them of their resources. He taught young Jesus how to be a carpenter. He also taught him about how to be a man and how to be a loving husband and father. Remember the words on the cross? Apparently, Joseph had passed on. And he told John to do what? Take care of his mother. You know, I have a feeling that he had done that for a good while. Even through his ministry, probably sending money or whatever he needed to do to take care of her. But now he wanted to turn that over to John when, since he was dying. And also, he was a great example as well, spiritually. We see Jesus coming and preaching in Nazareth after he starts his ministry at the age of 30. And when he comes there, he begins to preach. And it says that as he went into the synagogue, as was his custom on the Sabbath day. You know that, what that says, guys? It says Joseph went to church every week. It was his custom. Jesus was, he was, that was a normal thing for him. And then we find him going uh, to Jerusalem once a year for that, pat, for the Passover, the feast and things that were there. And again, it talks about his custom that he did that. He, he was spiritually an example for him. And how proud Joseph must have been, especially of that statement in Luke 2.52, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's kind of a summary of Jesus' teenage years, which it could be the summary of every teenager. <laughs> it says that Jesus grew and increased in favor with God and man. In other words, people around the village, and Jesus, he's a good boy. He helps out his mom and dad. He helps Joseph in the carpenter shop. He's going to be a good boy someday. A good man someday. Karen Kingsbury as an author who often writes about biblical stuff, but will kind of take it into a storyline maybe and add a little bit to it that maybe not necessarily in the Bible, but could possibly uh, have played out that way. In a book called The Family of Jesus, I got a few years back, it has a, a chapter on each character that's in Jesus's family, Mary, Joseph, um, Zechariah, Elizabeth, on and on. And in that, she closes out the chapter on Joseph by saying, we don't know when he died. It had to be sometime after the, the age 12 scene where he's lost at the temple and, and Joseph and them find him. And by the way, I think that was a very telling time for Joseph because they asked him, they said, Jesus, where were you at? Where, why did you leave us? Why? What are you doing? And what's his answer? Don't you know I'd be about my father's business? And at that point, Joseph knew it wasn't carpentry he was talking about. <laughs> it meant that he was about God's business, learning the Word of God, being ready to, to live the Word of God, being ready to give his life at the cross. Probably no other time did he, that hit him so much to remember that he was not necessarily Jesus' father, only an earthly one, only a foster one. His heavenly father was his father. But back to that, that book, Kingsbury writes, somewhere in that time period between uh, 12 and between Jesus going into ministry at 30, his father passed away. And again, we don't know why or we don't have the circumstances, but in the book, she writes how he possibly got a cold and began to get sicker. And then one day it was, it was very evident that he was going to die. And Mary calls him in and both of them are there and they talk about family life. And then Karen Kingsbury writes that Jesus told Joseph possibly these words. You've been the best dad 
on earth that I could ever have. I think every father would love to hear that from a kid if that was, if that was true. As I said, not in the Bible, but certainly because of what we see about his life and his devotion to Mary and to Jesus, probably a very good chance that was said. And finally, in verse 25, it says, well, verse 24, it says, Then Joseph being aroused from sleep, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took, him, took to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called him Jesus. So he follows those instructions, and he was a devoted believer and a partner in God's plan of salvation. Because he trusted the message of the angel and he committed his life to Jesus, he was a believer. Also, he was a silent partner, though. You know, you might have heard that phrase. It's kind of a, a phrase thrown around in the financial world. It means the person who gives some money, maybe helps with the capital of a business, but steps back and lets somebody else handle the day-to-day -day operations. Joseph was like that. He didn't have a lot of capital or money, but what he had, he gave. His life, his time, his efforts to take care of Mary, to take care of Jesus and he stepped back and he let, Jesus, let God, the sovereign father, take care of the day-to-day -day operations. Simply telling him what to do from each day to each day. Oh, how we need fathers like that today. I'm going to close by going back to that nativity scene. The first nativity was done December 24th, 1223. St. Francis of Assisi did that. He had gone two years earlier to the Holy Land and saw all the sights. And what really got to him the most was the sight of Jesus' birth. And again, up until that time, I mean, people talked about it, but there wasn't anything like a nativity scene or a, a live play or anything like that. It was just talked about. More focus on the death and resurrection, and, and, and as should be. But in this particular time, he, he was struck by that. And when he came back, he went to the Pope uh, to talk to him about his order. And also he asked the Pope, could I please make a nativity type scene that would show people about the birth of Christ? Why it's so, so important. And the Pope granted that. And so he went back. And within two weeks of getting back home, he sent word to a friend to get some things ready. Now... I don't know if Tommy could put Christmas at the corner together in two weeks or not. Probably not. This wasn't quite as big as that. He told a friend, he said, I'll need a cave on the side of the mountain. And there were some in that little village in Italy where he lived. I'll need a trough and I'll need some hay. And, that, and, and he said, and also if you'll, you can get a, a donkey and an ox. And that was it. They didn't have any of the wise men, any of the shepherds, anything like that. And they had a carved doll that St. Francis took, and in his arms as he took it, he actually cried over that doll. And he laid it in the, the trough. And then he turned and he preached to the glowing torch lights of the villagers about the babe in Bethlehem that had come to save them from their sins. Preach the gospel. It was an amazing time. And from that time, it, it just took off. One of the people that wrote about that in later a biographer about uh, St. Francis says that his aim was to kindle the people's hearts to be more devoted to the birth of Christ. I remember growing up camping and making fire and stuff like that. And one of the key elements is kindling. It is the little bitty sticks that you put together that once the fire gets started, it keeps it going and builds until you can add bigger stuff. Some of us, like he, like St. Saint, Saint Francis felt for his parishioners, we need to have Christmas rekindled in our life. We need, as Pastor Derek said last week, to have it more of a priority we need to make it special in our lives and in our families. So I want to ask you today, does your Christmas need kindling? Does it need to have power put to it? And if so, have you thought of a way to do that? Let me give you a couple of possibilities. One, don't spend so much on gifts 
We spend tons of money on gifts. And the more we do that, the more focus, I think, comes off Christ. Second, give. Give to Lottie Moon. Give to a cause, a mission, something that uplifts Christ's name and glory. Third, this is real simple. Get a nativity set. (laughs) Share it with your children or your grandchildren. Talk about what the characters did, what they mean. Also, Another thing you can do is write a prayer. Just write a prayer thanking God for the birth of Jesus and and read that prayer at the Christmas dinner. Invite someone to Christmas at the corner, maybe a neighbor. Get your family together or a group and go sing some Christmas carols to a nursing home or to some of our homebound people who never get that very much at all. And the last thing maybe... Commit yourself to invite one person to the gospel, to present the gospel to one person before December is over with. Wouldn't that be a great thing to do if somebody came to faith in the Lord during the month of December? That would be so awesome. Joseph, the silent guy of the Christmas story, but yet a very devoted guy whose actions spoke much louder than the absence of his words. This morning, you may be here. You may have never accepted Christ. Today's the opportunity to do that. Perhaps you need to rededicate your life to this idea of making Christmas more spiritual this year. Maybe pray about, come to the altar and pray about one of the things I mentioned to you. Or maybe you need to come and be a part of this church family. You know, you've been coming here for a while and And God's laid it on your heart that this is where you need to be. This is where you need to belong. It's the church that will help you grow. This is a place where you can serve. Maybe today also you just have some other burden. It might be for a family member who's sick. It may be for a lost person that you know during this Christmas season. It may be uh, some burden of a, a financial burden or a great problem you've got in your life. And this, the holidays just make it harder and worse. I invite you to come to the altar and pray. We'll have counselors down here to listen and to pray with you and to help you get through that decision that time. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And after that, I'll ask you to stand for our hymn of invitation. And you come as God leads you to today. Dear God, I thank you for today. Thank you for Joseph. Thank you for the message, God, that You've given us to look at him today. And I just pray, God, that we would have the devotion that he had to Christmas. That we would give of our time, our energy, our our money, Lord, to make Christmas what it should be about. And that's the gospel of Christ. That he came to save sinners and such we are, Father. And Lord, thank you for, again, the devotion of Joseph. Be with people today as they make decisions. Pray that you be with the Corner Church as well as they uh, hear about Joseph also today. We ask these things in your name. We pray, Jesus. Amen.